In this video, we're going to talk about the relationship between equivalence classes and partitions. And it's very important. An equivalence relation, of course, defines a set of equivalence classes. And these equivalence classes actually define a partition of a set. So that's what we're going to prove now. So we're going to assume that we have an equivalence relation, we'll call it R, on some non-empty set. And we'll let S be the set of all equivalence classes of R. So first of all, we're going to show that that set S is indeed a partition of R. And I'll remind you what a partition is in a second. And it works in the opposite direction as well. If you have a partition, then it defines an equivalence relation. You can make an equivalence relation from that partition. So let's get going. Let me remind you what a partition is. So a reminder. If we have some non-empty set, then a partition, let's call it S, I guess which we'll say is made up of some subsets here. Let's say K of them. So a partition S of A, no oh, wrong A, of A is such that And actually, let me be clear here. All of these SI are indeed subsets of A. So our partition is such that all of these SIs are non-empty. So we don't have any superfluous elements. We have that pairwise. If we have SI and SJ, just two of the S's in the set here. They have no elements in common. And that the union of all of these guys allows you to recover your initial set. So that's what a partition is. Okay. So now that we know what we need to prove, let's go ahead and do it. So let's start our proof. OK. So let's let S be the set of all equivalence classes of A. So it's everything that looks like that, where A is an element of our set. A. And remember, we're going through all of the elements of A here. But remember, from the last video, we said that if two things were in the same equivalence class, then they're related. So this is fine. OK. So we need to show, in fact, that each of these guys, each of these equivalence classes, is non empty. We need to show that the intersection of any two of them is empty. And we need to show that if we take the union of all of these guys, we, in do, we do indeed recover the original set. OK. So let's show that each of them is non-empty. OK. So let's consider the equivalence class of A. All right. Well, since R is an equivalence relation, we know that A is related to itself. It's reflexive. Since A is related to A, since R is an equivalence relation, we have that A is, of course, in the equivalence class of A. So we have something in the equivalence class, so all of these guys are non-empty. So A 
as the equivalence class of A as non empty. First bit done. Okay. Now, let's do the next bit. Let's pick two equivalence classes. Let's say the equivalence class of A and the equivalence class of B, and let's say they're different equivalence classes and show they have no element in common. So let's less the equivalence class of A and the equivalence class of B be elements of our set S, so they're equivalence classes where they're not the same thing, so we're not picking two of the same. And we need to show that the intersection is indeed empty. So, let's pick an element from the intersection and show that it can't exist. So, let's less call it x, let's have that be an element of the intersection of our equivalence classes. Okay, so what does that mean? So that means that x is indeed related to a, and x is indeed related to b. And we're going to show a little contradiction here. A contradiction is going to be, if there's an element in here, then these guys have to be equal. Okay, so let's go ahead and show this. So, since R is symmetric, it's an equivalence relation, we know that since x is related to a, it works in the opposite way as well. a is related to x. And since r is transitive, well, we have a is related to x, x is related to b, so that means that a is related to b. And let's say Let's say by, and I'll say this, what these are in a second, star and double star. So we'll call this guy star, or we'll call this guy double star since it's double underlined, and this guy star. So we know that. So now we have, well, A is related to B. But by the result in the previous section, Remember, example 32.2, we said A is related to B if and only if the equivalence classes are equal. So, let me scroll down to make a little more room here. So, by, let's say, example 32.2 in the previous video, we have that this means that, let's say it must be that A is indeed equal in its equivalence class to B. So the equivalence class of A equals the equivalence class of B. That's what the result from example 32.2 says. If you don't remember that, it's a good idea. Pause the video now, go back to that previous video, and just look at that. Okay, so up here, though, we said that A doesn't equal B in its equivalence class, but A can't equal B because that's how we picked those equivalence classes. Well, what does that mean? That means what we assumed here, that X is an element of the intersection, can't happen. This is a contradiction. So it must mean that this x cannot exist. So what does that mean? It 
means that the intersection of these guys is indeed empty. Now, we finished the second thing here. The third thing, we're going to show that the union of all of these guys is indeed our original set. Well, if we think about it, this argument here kind of does this third part for us. We know that any element is, an, uh, is a member of its own equivalence class, so every element is in some equivalence class. So if we take the union of all of them, we recover our original set. That's the idea. Let's write it down. Okay. So, since from above, we know that A is indeed an element of its own equivalence class for every A in our set A. We have the union of all of these. Let me write it using an indexed notation. So we'll say the union of equivalence classes with elements A, and I'll say for all A in our set A. So I'm using A as our index set here. So it's all elements of our index set A. So that means all equivalence classes with every possible element of A. So that's what I'm saying here. The union of all of these has to be indeed our original set. We get absolutely everything. So we're done here. So we did it. We showed the three properties of a partition are satisfied by equivalence classes. So that's really cool. Equivalence classes partition a set completely. Now, let's do the other direction. If we have a partition, we want to show that that partition defines an equivalence relation. So let me scroll down again and let's do this. Now, Less P, which is going to be a set of, we'll call them PIs, such that the PIs are a partition. A. Let's let that be a partition. Okay. Now we need to define our equivalence relation. And it can't be any simpler than what, how we're going to define it. So define the equivalence relation R by A is related to B exactly when A and B are elements of the same subset in our partition. Let's say for some i. OK, so we just need to show that this defines an equivalence relation. So we need to check that this is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So let's check. Let's do reflexive. So is A related to itself? Well, A is in some element, some subset of our partition, because, well, a partition partitions are set and every element's in exactly one 
of these subsets for some i. So we're good to go. The answer is yes. A is related to itself, of course. So, let's do the next. If A is related to B, is B related to A? So, let's let A be related to B. This means that A and B are in the same subset of a partition. So obviously, B is related to A as well. Okay, and I just want to point out that when we say an element is indeed an element of one of the subsets of the partition, it's exactly one, because remember, Each element of a set is in only one subset of the partition. Okay. So, we have reflexivity. We have symmetry. Maybe I'll green underline these where we like that we've had these results. And the last thing we need is transitivity. So, let's do the last one here. If A is related to B, and B is related to C, is A related to C? And this is pretty easy to see as well. Well, if A is related to B, what do we have? That means that A and B are in the same subset of our partition, and it means that B and C are in the same subset of our partition. In fact, let me call this, just for now, I'm going to call this PJ, because they could be different. They're not. We just have to reason that they, these, this PI and this PJ are the same set. So, Since each element of A is in exactly one, and that's the key, it's in exactly one of the subsets of our partition. Well, what does this mean? This means Since B is in PI and B is in PJ, well, it must be that PI and PJ have to be the same subset of a partition. Ostensibly, you could think, well, maybe these guys are different, this PJ and PI, maybe these guys are different, different subsets of our partition, but remember, B has to be in both of them. B is in exactly one of these guys, so they must be the same. So, what does that mean? Thus, A and C are in PI, and A is related to C. Putting these together, have, we have that R is an equivalent relation. And we're done. So let's recap what we did in this um, part of the proof. We defined a relation R saying that two elements are related when they're in the same subset of our partition. And we showed 
that R is reflexive. Let me mark here the other ones. Reflexive, symmetric. And here, this is transitive. So, we showed indeed that this relation was symmetric, reflexive, and transitive. So it's an equivalence relation. And what's cool is that we didn't say anything particular about our partition, except it was sub-partition of A. So any partition defines an equivalence relation just by saying elements are related when they're in the same subset of our partition. That's really cool. And in the next video, we'll do just a couple more examples using partitions and equivalence classes.